Good morning. We're glad that you have tuned in to be with the Castleview elders this morning. Uh, as you know, it's been an unusual few days, to say the least. Uh, as far as I know, this is the first time that a lot of American churches have all closed down on a Sunday uh, since 1918, the Spanish flu, just over 100 years ago. Um, it's extremely unusual to cancer our gathering, and it's really sad for us to do so. And it's, it's really just at the request of our leaders, our God-given government leaders, uh, that we are temporarily suspending our gatherings. We're doing it, uh, we pray, not out of fear, but out of love for our neighbors. Uh, our content this morning is going to have a little bit of a different feel, and that's by design. So our approach is not, we still get to have church, it's just going to be a little different because it's online. Um, instead, we're recognizing that church is something that happens when we assemble together as the body of Christ. And in God's providence, it seems that it's best not to assemble right now. And I think it's, it's good for us to feel sad that we're missing out on that assembling, on that gathering together. Um, so this is not a church gathering per se in the same way. Uh, we don't want to think of it as a substitute for church or uh, really just as good. So we're not going to try to reproduce all the elements or even the feel of a Sunday morning service. As you can tell from our setup, this is very different than what we typically have when we gather together. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to find ways, try to get creative and think of how can we best continue to shepherd the flock? How can we continue to uh, minister God's word? How can we continue to care for one another? We have the technology in God's providence to do so. Uh, we knew that your schedules would probably be open right now at this time. So we thought it would be good to still spend this time um, getting on camera and, and sharing from God's word. So what we're going to do this morning, we're going to have times where different elders are praying we're going to read some passages of Scripture, and then I've prepared uh, what in some ways is like a sermon, a shorter message on the Lord's Prayer from Matthew 6. Uh, so that's kind of what you can expect. It'll be a little bit more informal, uh, but we trust it will still be helping us to worship God and focus our thoughts and our attention toward Him. Let me open us in, in prayer. God, we pray that you would be at work among us. Though we're not the church gathered, we are the church scattered this morning. We still are your people. You still are our God. And we pray that you would uh, give your blessing to us. We pray that you'd give wisdom to government leaders in these days. We pray that you'd give wisdom to us as church leaders. Uh, we pray that we as your people would continue to worship you every day. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to start out, Chris. Uh, Bewley is going to read Psalm 46. Psalm 46. To the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. During times of crisis, people want to know uh, where they can look for help, where they can look for hope. Uh, we often, I think, today turn to our phone or to a computer, and we're trying to get more information about a crisis like this. And we read articles, but, but even as we do that, which is a fine thing to do, uh, we recognize as Christians that our hope ultimately, our help ultimately 
does not come from having more information. Our hope comes from the Lord. Our help comes from the Lord, who's the maker of heaven and earth. Uh, So whether we're feeling anxious or angry or frustrated or confused, we can turn to God and we turn to him primarily in his word and we turn to him in prayer. So I want to spend some time this morning meditating on the Lord's prayer as Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, kind of walking through phrase by phrase and considering, especially in these days under this crisis, uh, how we can be rightly praying and rightly responding. So Don, would you read for us Matthew 6, 9 to 13? Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Consider there how he uh, starts out the prayer with those first two words, our Father. So right, right at the start, even from those beginning words, our attention is drawn outward and also upward, right? It's drawn outward in that word, our. This prayer is very personal, but it's not a private prayer between just one individual and God. It is a prayer for the people of God collectively. During times of crisis, during times of personal suffering, uh, it's really tempting to turn inward and to just be thinking about ourselves, myself, my problems, and to, our world can get really small. We get really drawn inward. And we forget about everybody else. Uh, There's definitely a responsibility we have to care for those near us, care for our family or our neighbors or our church members. Uh, But but times of suffering and times of scarcity does not make it okay to be selfish. So so we should not be the ones who are, just to give one recent example, raiding grocery store aisles with the attitude of, you know, I just got to look out for myself. I got to think about me and forget about everybody else. That's their problem. No, as, as Christians, individually, we're called to love our neighbors. And as the church, we share this same father. He is our father. We're part of the same family. And that means that we are especially concerned for the well-being, not just of ourselves, but the rest of the body. He says, our father in heaven. He is our father. The disciples are in this together, but they're not just looking to one another for support. They're looking beyond themselves, beyond their collective resources, and they're looking up to heaven, which is why we pray, right? If, if that's not true, why pray? We are, when we pray, appealing to the one who stands in heaven, to the ruler of the universe. And he is the ruler of the universe. He is in heaven. And he, we have this personal title, Father. We're to call him Father, not just creator, not just ruler or master, not governor or Mr. President. We call him our Father. He's in charge, he's above us, but he cares for us as his children. What do we pray to him? What should we be praying in these times or at any time? First thing we pray is that his name would be hallowed. In other words, we're praying, Father, would your name be set apart as holy? Would your name be exalted? Would your name be lifted up? Would your name be revered as it deserves? So we pray that his name would be hallowed, and it's also appropriate when we pray to begin with hallowing his name, praising him for who he is, lifting him up, exalting him. And we have so many reasons to do that. Here are a couple that that I think stand out, especially in a time of crisis. God is sovereign. He is the creator and king over all. Psalm 115 says, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Ephesians 1 says that all things happen according to the counsel of his will. Here's a real personal take on his sovereignty in Psalm 139. The psalmist writes, Your your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Even before we were born, our days were written in his book. Our days are in his hands. He planned them before 
we were born. He is sovereign. So we want to praise him for that, lift him up for that. We also praise him because he is, again, our loving father. So he takes his sovereignty and he unleashes it. He uses it for the good of his people. Romans 8, 28. He works all things for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. So nothing comes to us as his children without first passing through the filter of his goodness, the filter of his fatherly love and care for us. And we can find great assurance in that, and we should praise him for that. So we're going to do that. We're going to pause right here in the message, and we're going to praise God for who he is. Andrew, would you lead us in a prayer of praise? Our Father, we do praise you. We praise you. You are our rock and our refuge. You are our fortress and our strength. We praise you because you are both sovereign and personal. You're all powerful. You're all present. We so often are unstable, insecure, but you are timeless, unchanging. You are the most high God. We praise you for who you are. Nothing nor anyone is above you in power or position or ability. We praise you that just as you were with uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you continue to be with us and you continue to be our God. We praise you that our greatest need and our greatest, most essential provision, the forgiveness of sin and the removal of your wrath has been secured by the hands of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. You have secured our future. You've made ready a place for us. You are both the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, and you are Adonai. You are all these things and more, and we praise you for who you are. You are our deepest joy. You are our portion. You are a God in whom we can trust. Thank you for making us your possession in Christ, and it's in Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Amen. We move on in the prayer to verse 10. It says, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This virus is another reminder, once again, that we live in a Genesis 3 world. We live in a world under the curse. We live in a world that is fallen because of sin. At the same time, the kingdom has come through Jesus Christ. It's an already not yet kingdom. And as Christians, our citizenship is in heaven, right? So we belong to another world, another kingdom, where everything functions as it should, properly, according to God's design. But it's not like that here on earth. And we're reminded of that this week. And so what are we to pray? Well, we look and pray for the realities of that kingdom to be realities here on earth. We pray that our friends and neighbors would bow the knee in allegiance to Christ the King. We look forward to the day when the King returns, when he brings heaven to earth. And when we feel these effects of life in a fallen world, we, we should pray that he would come quickly to reign. That's what we see in Revelation. Lord, come quickly. One thing we don't want to overlook here is, is how verse 10 points us back to verse 9. So verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we're praying that his will would be done on earth as in heaven. How is God's will done in heaven? Well, fundamentally, God's name is hallowed. It is set apart as holy. Right, when we think about living in a fallen world, we should think of diseases, we should think of wars, but it's not just that viruses are spreading, even more fundamentally, it's that people like us, sinful by nature, do not think of God as we should. We don't set him apart as holy as we should. We think a lot about ourselves. We think a lot of our wisdom and our worth, but we give very little thought to the God who made us. And by giving little thought to him, we, in effect, minimize his wisdom, minimize his worth. So when we pray here, we are praying not only that the virus would stop spreading, which we do pray for, but also that God would use this crisis to open people's eyes, that his will would be done on earth as in heaven by bringing more and more people to rightly see God for who he is, to revere him and to humble themselves before him. Going to verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. It is hard not to take God's provisions for granted for most of us. 
at least those of us who are living in times and places of such great prosperity, uh, most of us, I think, especially those of us who are relatively younger, have never had to wonder or really think about, I wonder if there will be food on the table at the next meal. We've not had to deal with that. During times of panic like this, where we see a lot of, a lot of panic around us, uh, sometimes we get a small reminder that we're not entitled to anything, uh, that, that these things are not guaranteed to us, right? Food is not guaranteed to us, or health, or public services, certainly convenience. Everything that we have that is good is a gift of God's grace. So, thinking about a time like this, when there are a lot of fears, when there's a lot of concern, and some of those fears could be realized. We don't know. When the economy sinks, when we read articles about how uncertain the future is, what do we do? We should not panic. We also shouldn't shrug it off and find hope in the fact that, well, I'm sure things will be fine. You know, we've always had plenty. I'm, I'm sure we're going to have plenty again in the future. Is the, I'm, I'm sure we're just overreacting and everything's going to be fine. Well, if things are fine, that's by God's grace. We are dependent on him in times of plenty and in times of want. So instead, I think what we want to do, as Jesus teaches us here, is to turn to God in prayer and ask him for daily provision, for health, for wise government leaders, for food. And when we do that, it helps us to remember that as we receive those good things, we're receiving them not because they're automatic, not because they're inevitable, but because God has again graciously extended those gifts. Verse 12. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Here we have a reminder uh, that we are to forgive those who wrong us. It's not an option as a Christian to withhold forgiveness. We also remember that we need forgiveness for the debt that we owe. Who do we owe this debt to? Well, who are we praying to here? We're, for, we're praying to God that he would forgive us our debts, the debts that we owe him because of our sin. And this is the universal human need, as we've already prayed about this morning, to be forgiven by God. Our health and our safety is not as great a need as our need for forgiveness. I'm sure you've been reading, as I have, about death rates of different viruses. And you're, you're trying to figure out what are the death rates, what percent of people who get X virus die, how does that compare to other viruses. The reality remains that the death rate overall has not changed. It is 100%. And your death is no more likely or less likely because of the coronavirus. It is a certainty. My death is a certainty, no matter what. And it's true for us. It's also true for our friends. It's true for our neighbors. You think of the paralytic who came to Jesus. His friends bring him. Uh, they, they are such good friends. They, they open up the, the roof of the house to lower him down because it's so crowded. They've obviously brought him there to be healed. That's what he needs. That's what he wants. And Jesus turns to him and says, your sins are forgiven. It's so striking how Jesus, though he can heal him and in a few moments will actually heal him to show his authority, he gets to the heart of the issue. He gets to his greatest need and he says, no, your sins are forgiven. I have the authority to forgive sins and that's what you need most, even if you're paralyzed, even if you're on a ventilator or in need of a ventilator and don't know if you'll get one, your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven. So we should continue to confess our sins to God and also to plead with him to use these days to help people see their need of forgiveness. And we want to be ready. We want to be ready to look for opportunities to engage people with the gospel, to help them see that we can face these times not in fear, but in hope because, not because we're blind optimists, but because we are forgiven. Our death is certain, but Jesus' death for sins, his resurrection, is our hope and the only hope for eternal life. Verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. Verse 12 reminds us that we're sinful. Verse 13 reminds us that we are weak, that we are prone to be tempted. And we need to pray to God to deliver us from temptation. So how have you been tempted in these last few days? What temptations are most uh, difficult for you to resist? Are you tempted with pride or anger? I've seen quite a bit of this. I'm sure the rest of us have. Maybe we've even felt it in our own hearts. Pride and anger, I see it expressed online. Uh, Some are angry because they think people are overreacting. Others are angry because they think we're not taking this seriously enough as a society or other people. I think there's a place for hard conversations, honest conversations, as we're wrestling with how should we as a society respond? How should we as Christians respond? But in the process of those conversations and those considerations, do you find anger and pride cropping up in your heart? James says in James chapter 1, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. As we're having these conversations, we want to keep asking ourselves, okay, what is my role in this conversation, in this discussion, in this situation? Fundamentally, our role as Christians is to represent God rightly. But when we have pride and anger, it keeps us from doing this. James says here that human anger, man's anger, does not bring about a righteous life. So when we feel this pride and anger welling up, We want to remind ourselves that there's something more important than than being right about every question or every issue. More fundamentally, we're here to represent God, to be faithful to him, to honor him, and to consider how can we best help and love others. So we pray, Lord, deliver us from the temptation toward pride and anger. Maybe your temptation is not anger as much as it is anxiety Fear. We have anxious fears that are tempting us. We're waking up in the middle of the night, first thing in the morning, reading articles online, and we're tempted to be fearful. So I, I, I just before we began here, asked a couple of elders, you know, where would you point people in Scripture, people who are struggling with fear and anxiety, whether it's about a virus or about any, anything else in their lives? So Kelly, first, where would you point people in Scripture? who are struggling with fear and anxiety. Yeah, Yeah, I I think it's important when we think about how are we reacting to what's happening around us. We we definitely don't want hopeless fear, um, panic, but we also don't want naive happiness, right? And we also don't want stoicism. We're we're not just meant to kind of be flat as the world is uh, struggling around us. And in Scripture, the Scriptures do speak of having emotions of being troubled and distressed and sorrowed and lonely and afflicted and doesn't automatically say that those are sinful because actually all those descriptors describe Jesus. So in John 12, when he's thinking about his death, he says out loud, well, I am now sorrowful. My soul is troubled. Or in Mark 14, when he's getting ready to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's described as greatly distressed and troubled, and he even says to his disciples around him, my soul is sorrowful even to death. So first off, I just want to say, if if you are feeling anxious or fearful or sorrow or trouble or distress, I, I, I would encourage you not to start by thinking that's sin and wrong and how to shut it off. But I think instead considering what would God want you to do while you're feeling that way. And I think scripture shows us clear examples that in our sorrow or anxiety or fear, we're called to turn to God in prayer. And so I would encourage you, Psalm 25, uh, verses 16 and 17. I think David is a great example to us of someone who turns to the Lord and in the way that he prays in that psalm, I think gives us an example of how we can go to God this way. He says, he says to God, turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. 
bring me out of my distresses. So I just encourage you, if you're feeling that way, God wants you to talk to him about it. He, he wants to hear from you. And not to just correct you or instruct you or chastise you, but to love you as the father that Nathan was reminding us he is uh, in that prayer. So our father wants to hear from us. He wants us to talk to him and to cast our anxieties on him, like Peter says, because he cares for us. Jim, would you uh, share from where you might point people in Scripture who are anxious? Yeah, um, Psalm 121 comes to mind for me, um, thinking of where our help does come from, um, rather than turning, as you said, to media or to stockpiling reserves of food and, and resources. Um, our help comes from the Lord. Um, just let His Word speak speak for him here. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. So you may wonder, God, are you here? What, what has happened? Have you stepped away? But, but he is still here. He is still caring for us. Uh, it says that the Lord is our keeper. He is our shade on our right hand. The sun shall strike you day by day, uh, you by day, nor the, nor the moon by night. Um, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. He is and always will be with us, and we can take comfort in that. One other um, place that we can go, there's so many places in Scripture that address our anxiety and our fearfulness because God remembers that we are dust and that we need uh, help and encouragement and support. Psalm 16, as I've been studying in, in Acts chapter 2 and looking ahead to what we'll have in our Acts sermon series, uh, these are some verses that Peter quotes, uh, but Psalm 16 Verse 8 says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to shale or let your Holy One see corruption. Peter is quoting here at Pentecost, and he says that David spoke these words, but he spoke them as a prophet about Jesus who was to come. He said, you will not abandon my soul to the grave. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. And this points forward to Jesus' resurrection. Jesus died, but did God abandon his soul? No, he did not. Did he let him see corruption? No, his body did not see any decay. Why? Because he got up from the grave. Because of resurrection. He was not left to decay in the grave. This is true of Jesus and we learn that this is true of all who are in Jesus also. What is so scary about getting sick? What is so scary about death? Much of that is being alone, being abandoned, being cut off from everyone and everything that is good. And yet we have this hope and this promise that if our trust is in Jesus Christ alone to save us, then resurrection is in our future. And that means that no matter what tomorrow brings... You will not be alone. He will not abandon your soul in life or in death. So we can face the future, eyes wide open, honest, and yet hopeful, knowing that as humans, we live knowing that we all die. Right? That, that is to be human, is to, to live knowing that you will die. And yet, as those who belong to Christ, we die knowing that we will live again. So no pandemic, no other nightmare worst case scenario that we can think up, that we can dream up, that we can read about, can take that hope away from us. So let's continue in that confidence. Let's face this day and this week confident, not in ourselves, not in our ability to, to figure things out, 
and to protect ourselves, but confident in him. I want to turn to, to continue praying to God and now casting our cares on him. So Gus is going to lead us here in a prayer of a petition to God. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, our rock, our refuge, we remember at this time your a kind command that we cast all our anxieties on you because you do care for us. And we remember too the Lord Jesus who said to us, come to me all who are burdened and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Father, we do acknowledge um, that we are burdened, we are heavy laden, many of us are anxious, so we come to you asking for, for help, for strength. And we come confidently uh, not because uh, we are good in ourselves, but because you are good and you have given us an all-sufficient Savior who covers our sinfulness, uh, who forgives us, uh, who is our righteousness. And Lord, many of us are rather bewildered, uh, struggling to, to believe that this global pandemic threatens our welfare, our lives. Please would you help us to process uh, these uh, news events uh, wisely. Well, we pray that you'd even use these words from uh, your uh, servant Nathan this morning uh, to uh, bring clarity to our minds, uh, to cause us to be grounded in the gospel, uh, to take our view from eternity as we think about these things. Lord, give us wisdom also as we think about what it means to follow you and to love each other in uh, these uncertain days, in days of uh, social distancing. We do want to continue to love each other. We, we do want to continue to bear one another's burdens, so we ask for your help. Help us to be uh, wise, uh, prudent, uh, and yet creative. We thank you for technology. We, we pray that we would use this even in these days to, to love each other well. Father, we know that uh, this uh, pandemic uh, would have rippling effects into our society, and we recognize that some in our congregation would be affected uh, more adversely than others, and we do pray for them. Or we pray for older members who may be more anxious than others. Or would you be their comfort, their strength? Or we think of those who work in the restaurants and the hospitality industry who, who may lose income. Or we, we pray that you would provide for them. Or we pray that uh, those uh, of us who have plenty at this time, we pray we, we would remember those who have less. Father, we, we know that there are uh, me, our mem many of our members or some of our members who, who live alone and who may feel more alone during these days. Oh, Father, we pray that you would give us uh, hearts of generosity, and that we would reach out to them, and that we would love them, we, we would care for them. Lord, we thank you for the members that you've given us who work in healthcare. We think of Cassie Jones, Bethany Crawshaw, Julie Gallifer, even Joe Deck. We pray you'd strengthen them in these days. We pray that their testimony would shine brightly. We pray you'd use them to bring uh, love and care and affection uh, to those who are suffering. We pray that you'd make them aware of opportunities to speak the gospel. We, we pray that for all of us. Although in these days of fear and anxiety, we pray that you teach us how to redeem the time. We pray that the great truths of the gospel would be in our hearts bringing comfort and on our lips bringing hope. Lord, we, we thank you that, that these things are not a surprise to you. These days have been planned out from the beginning. We thank you that our Savior is one who has died and has been risen and reigns from on high. Oh, Lord, we pray that these truths would be our comfort in these days. We ask this all now in Jesus' name. Amen. In a minute here, we're going to have the feed cut out, and uh, we're, we're going to take some time for those of us who are here um, to pray for some more items that are on the prayer guide. Uh, you, you should have received a prayer guide in an email. Check your uh, spam folder if you haven't seen that yet, uh, but that can help guide your prayers. Um, we're going to have more conversations in the coming week as leaders um, about decisions that need to be made going forward, so we'll update you about those uh, in the coming days. In the meantime, I just encourage you to, to continue to reach out to one another and to be quick to share any needs that you have with us, with one another. Uh, we want to know how we can best love and care for one another during these just really unique times. Um, until we gather again, know that we love you very much, and we very much look forward to when we can gather together again as a church.